Brilliant. We're talking now with Perry Brass, who's a fantastic author, uh, activist, and all around a good egg, and I believe a Virgo. And a Minch. And a Minch. And a Minch. I had not and a nice, you were a Minch. Nice also. Southern Jewish boy. <laughs> not a nice Southern are you, Jewish. Are you Jewish? Not a, a, a nice Southern Jewish gay boy from Savannah, Georgia. Oh no! Oh, what a cross to bear and that is. is. Good a Lord. strange hybrid. A strange. I describe Southern Jews as having all of the prejudice of the South, all the neuroses of the Jews without the warmth of the South and the passion of the Jews. It doesn't make you very popular with some <laughs> no, of no, But there are a couple sure. of nice ones of us. I mean, and, some, and some very hot guys. Really? Amazing hot Southern Jewish hot guys. Hot Southern Jewish men. Oh, yeah. I felt like if you had a website called hotjewishsouthernmen.com, you would be popular. Fortune. They're delicious. <laughs> They're delicious. Are they delicious? They're delicious. Oh, you don't delicious. expect them. Right. It's unexpected. No, you don't expect them. So what was it like growing up um, in, 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 in the South being mm -hmm. Jewish? Being Jewish in the South prepared you for being gay, because you're always an outsider. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Jews in the South have this tendency to want to be Southern first and Jewish second. Uh, they're like closet Jews. In fact, to find a real Jew, a real Jew in the South is kind of uh, unexpected, and it's kind of like finding a, a flaming queen. It's like you flame Jewish, like you want to be preppy, and, and you want to be one of those um, uh, happens to be Jewish people. Like, I mean, if you're a real Yid in the South, in fact, the worst thing, I remember as a kid, having we'd have these contests with each other. Who looks the most Jewish? Like, you look more Jewish than you look. <gasps> you know, it's like being gay. It's like, you can pass for not being gay, or you can pass for not being Jewish. And I could pass for not being Jewish because you, I, you, are you I have blue eyes. Yes. Okay. So I could pass for not being Jewish, so that was very good. But then there's this other part of you that, like, you know, you grow up like this, and I had to be brainwashed for the whole thing, and Hebrew school, and the bar mitzvah, and the whole number, as they say, the whole mishigas. And my father uh, <coughs> was very Southern and very Jewish. He was what we call a hunting and fishing man, which is very unusual for a yid, Absolutely. for a Jew. Sure. But he loved hunting and fishing and good old boys, and uh, getting down there and talking, and, and, and you know, and he was very Southern and very Jewish. He could speak fluent Yiddish, and he could speak Yiddish with his southern good old boy friends, which was amazing, because some of them were <laughs> learning Yiddish words, and they'd come up and say, your father, your papa has good cough. <laughs> wow, you know. What the but, um, but that's a strange hybrid that I come from. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, sp I did time in, in the South of myself, and it, it's so funny, like, uh, the sort of language and culture that's just accepted, it's just normal, like when I was in the third grade, uh, I showed up with a new jacket, um, and um, someone said, where'd you get that new jacket? And someone else said, oh, uh, you stole it off a dead nigger, didn't you? And everyone laughed, and, like this was the funniest thing. Yeah. It's just normal. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't until I, I moved away from there and realized, yeah. oh my god, yeah. this yeah. is part of the vernacular. You had that epiphany to realize that is not what normal life is. Life. Yes, I, I had that quite early. when I. I think when I was about nine years old, in fact, about nine, I had this strange epiphany. And I don't know how it happened to me at nine. I, mean, I, had, I had two great epiphanies in this period of my life in Savannah. And one of them was the realization that there are two realities, there are two forms of life. There's the reality of life as people want it to be, which at that point in the South was that uh, black people were an inferior form of life who should be hidden away, and queer people you know, they didn't exist. And then there's the reality of life as it actually is, which is reality. And I don't know how I figured that out by nine, but I did. And I think that uh, growing up uh, in the strange way, the, the, the Jewish Southern way, did it. And then when I was 15, I had another great epiphany, which was uh, I went through the worst year of my life. Um, I uh, realized then that I really was this thing that I could not even put a name on, but I knew that since I was it, I would probably be murdered. Uh, I'd be ostracized. Uh, it would be the end of my life, but I suddenly realized this was it. I was this thing. I was the, what all the queer jokes were about, all the faggot jokes were about, all the ugliness was, I was it. And I was having terrible problems with my mother, and she and I were gonna destroy each other because I realized that I was going to be an independent person and not a mama's boy. And I was uh, 
was a nice Jewish boy had grown up to be, a castrated mama's boy. And I realized that, and uh, between the two of them, I tried to kill myself, which a lot of 15-year-old gay boys yeah, do. Yeah, it's I an epidemic. That, that, yes. that age of 15 yep. is a very dangerous age. Yep. And uh, I over OD'd on my mother's sleeping pills, and uh, she figured it out and took me to the emergency room of Savannah uh, Hospital at night. Uh, anyway, uh, about a couple of weeks later, I had this epiphany, and I decided that I was worth keeping alive. And I would stay alive no matter what. I was a worthwhile person. And I would never allow anyone to drop me in suicide again. And it was like, you know, it was like a coming out into myself. And that was the great epiphany of that period. That's amazing. Well, it really, um, I think having that changed everything. And then I was uh, one of these quote, gifted kids. So I was going to graduate from high school at 16. So the next year was my senior year. And I decided to be the meanest son of a bitch. <laughs> a conscious decision. Yes. I said, I said, and I became literally one of the most popular kids in my high school. I mean, all the little shit asses who said, oh, you know, parents are queer, they all started coming up to me because I just snubbed them the whole way. I was a mean queen. And I didn't even know it. I didn't know what a mean queen was, but I was a mean queen. And I became instant popularity. It's like, what does this kid have that we want that he's not going to give us? Right, right. And um, it really worked. I think it's a valuable lesson for all you kids watching, watching this video. At Don't home. give it away. That's right. Make them pay for it. Make them work make really them, hard for make it. Make them work for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's the key to popularity. It's it, so it, bizarre. It, it really worked. It really worked. And uh, I think that uh, when I first came to New York, uh, well, coming to New York was so amazing because, again, I was this nice Southern Jewish boy. And New Yorkers were just, they were thrilled with me. They couldn't quite understand me. I was so exotic. Like, to begin with, I wasn't a wasp, but I wasn't a Yankee. And I didn't act like a yid. Like, I wasn't pushy, and I wasn't all, and I, you know, I was like, I didn't act like either of these groups. So. It was amazing, like I could draw people to me, and I understood that. And uh, the only bad thing about being in that situation when you're young is that you might have the illusion it's going to last forever. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had to give up that illusion. Yes, you will be awakened rudely yeah. at some yeah. point. Well, yes. I, the, the rude awakening wasn't didn't last that long. I, I mean, it wasn't. You know, I kept thinking that uh, 50 was going to be 25 with just more wrinkles. That was my feeling. Uh, so I had this sort of terrible feeling that at 25 I was going to wake up and I would look like some wildebeest. <laughs> no one would ever want me again, and that didn't happen. And it didn't happen at 35. At 25, you thought that. Oh, yeah, of course happen. you do. Good Lord. Lord. Because you've been young all your That's life. That's true. It's when you're true. 25, you're young all your life. You yeah. don't know what it's like not to yes. be young. Yes. When you're 35, you've had 10 years of not being so young, yes. so you kind of know what's going to happen. Yes. But it didn't happen at 25, and it didn't happen at 35, and it didn't happen at 45, but it really started to happen at 55. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I mean, you can't do this forever. Yeah. Cary Grant couldn't watch it all. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that was that was one of those things that you learn. But coming to New York as a nice Southern Jewish boy, oh, and I had, by New York standards, beautiful manners. Yes, it could right. get over yes. that yes. Southern yes. manner. Yes. It yes. really works. That was one of the things, you know, I lived in Birmingham, Alabama. And that's I just came from there. Did you really? I just came from there. Yeah, my partner's from Birmingham. Really? Yeah. And, uh, you know, this, and I, I lived there in the 60s when, you know, George Wallace was, oh, was the... Uh, heavy, horrible. Place. El Presidente. And, oh. and, of course, there were many horrible things about it, but I lived such a, in such a cloistered little world. Where did you live? Uh, I lived in Hueytown, a suburb just outside of, uh, of Birmingham. Um, oh, okay. And uh, one of the... One of the things that I sort of took for granted was those manners, that gentility. Oh yeah, I just oh, I was I was a complete sucker for it. Yeah. Yeah. I still am. Softness of the voice. And I, how still I, do. I still am. I still am. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Y'all come back. Now. I know. Yeah. I know. I just I just love it. I just love it. And and the, the terrible thing is, I'm I'm doing a, my next book is going to be called The Manly Art of Seduction, Ooh. and I'm talking about what it's like to grow up as a you know as a southerner. Southerners. Make seduct they still keep seduction as an art form down there. But you have to be very careful about it because Southern men are so seductive that they don't know how seductive they are. And I grew up in this world where everyone seduced everybody else, but they didn't mean it. It was just part of the whole yeah. game. Yeah. And
And a lot of guys have gotten killed that way. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, you'd think that some guy's seducing you, and he's not. It's just he doesn't know how not to be seductive. Yeah, it's woven into the fabric yes, of, it is. of social intercourse. It really is. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So how old were you when you came to New York? I was. I came to New York a month before I turned 19. So you were still a baby in arms. Yeah. But the, the thing I wrote about in the anthology took place when I was 17. And that was when I spent, uh, I left Savannah, Georgia. Uh, after having a year at the University of Georgia, I call it my year of incarceration at the University of Georgia. They're this, bulldogs, aren't they? They're bull, you were bulldog for nine months? Bullshit. No, I, it, was, it was like, I, I described, this was back in the mid-60s, right. and I described it as an ag frat jock school. Yeah. And yeah. I wasn't an yeah. ag student. I wasn't a frat student. I wasn't a jock student. So I didn't belong, and I hated it. And I remember at one point, and I talk about this in, in my piece in the book, I heard people say that <clears throat> uh, San Francisco was just crawling with queers, and you could do anything you wanted to do there. So I decided I would go to San Francisco, and that summer, I was still I was 17 years old, I hitchhiked from Savannah to San Francisco. And uh, it was just, a, you know, suddenly all these guys were just staring at me all the time. I mean, it was this young, pretty boy, and they were just, what? Ah! <laughs> uh, but I couldn't survive in San Francisco, so I ended up in LA, and that's when I learned how to Utilize those gifts of being young and scrumptious mm. to make money. To make money. Yeah. Yes, to have uh, men uh, yes. pay for my favors. Sure. Yes. Sure. Get a roof over your head. Get some clothes. Uh, I did. I the, the roof over my head and the the clothes thing was very tenuous. I mean, my idea of a roof over my head was like having some place to stay for two nights in a row. I see. That was that I was see. the roof over my head. I yes. See. That was definitely it. Uh, but it was also uh, the idea that. Uh, I didn't come off like a hustler. Yeah, right. I mean, like so many hustlers come off threatening, whereas I was like this pretty uh, seductive, gracious kid from the South. And that, of course, was in, you know, was in good stead for me. Yeah, high demand. That worked, that worked very, very well. Oh, yeah. yes. And it was not something that I was pleased with doing, because being from the South, I mean, prostitution in the South is very low. We don't have that catch and carry basis for life that you have in the great northern cities where everyone realizes they're a whore. You know, but in the South, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to have this constant illusion that, you know, you are above all that. You, we, we think I am trash. You know, you wouldn't do anything like that. I mean, ev I mean every fucking woman is one. I mean, every, I mean basically. I mean, and, and I used to always say that if I had a choice between being a secretary and being a high paid, you know, whore or prostitute or you know, I mean, I would want to be a very well-kept woman. Yes. Uh, then, of course, I would, wait, what is the choice? I mean, what is, and the, the worst form of male prostitution I ever encountered was when I first came to the city, I worked in advertising. <laughs> that Ad agencies were the worst form of male prostitution I had ever, I mean, everyone is a male prostitute. They're the cruelest pimps in the world, oh, those people, it's aren't just they? total, I mean, you're, you're selling a lie, it's yes. all about lying, yes. everything's about lying, and you have this tiny little bit of, of the idea that you're, you're giving people information, yeah. which is exactly what prostitution is about. Right. You give people a little bit of information, yeah. and all the rest of it is just you know, selling some piece of flesh, some piece of yourself, yeah. some piece of, of intimacy, which may not be intimacy, in fact, probably isn't. Yeah. But that's what advertising was about. So I worked in advertising my first about three years here. And it's all about tricking people. Totally. Same thing. It's about and tricking people and being a trick. And being a trick. And yes. being a trick. Yes. And, and getting as, a money, as much money as you can out of the trick. Yes, it yes. is. It yes. really is. Yes. I mean, but the, the real trick are the public. Yeah. I mean, they're the real tricks. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, people don't understand what is the most sole product on television. The single most sole product on television. It's the audience. Mm -hmm. The audience is being sold to the sponsor right. through the ad yeah, agency. Yeah, so the most sole thing on TV is the audience, the, the people who are going to, I mean, you'll do anything to get them, you know, to come in and look at you. I mean, at this point, almost nothing's too low. In fact, nothing is too low. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when you were in L.A., were you like, you weren't walking on Santa Monica Boulevard? Were occasionally. You? Were you really? Oh! Oh, yes. Wow. Yes, occasionally. Wow. Yeah. That's and Hollywood that, Boulevard. The Hollywood which was Boulevard. Central. Yes. I describe yes. it as, it was my summer of wow. living um, city of night. It was my city of night summer. It was my John Ritchie summer. I met him recently. What a wonderful writer. He's, he's great. He's fantastic. He's, fantastic. Yeah. he's an amazing person. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I mean, he's 
he's, he's become and stayed John Retchie longer than anybody else has. <laughs> right, right. He's outlived all of his competitors, even the people who copied him. He's outlived them too. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's not easy. No, it isn't. Yeah. And, and did you, uh, did you guys get into cars with men you didn't know? <gasps> Yes. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking. No, no, no it, wasn't, it wasn't, that's not the, that wasn't the situation. It wasn't the situation of getting into cars with men I didn't know. It was a situation of keeping the cars away from me. I mean, at that point, LA was so car cruisy oh, that I, I would be see. stopping yeah, yeah, like yeah. to get a bus <laughs> and three guys would <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop, there and say, stop in front of me and say, can I give you a lift? So of course I said yes. And then they say something like, well, do you want to you know, come over and do something? And, that's, and I'd say, well, I didn't plan on it, but yeah, why not? And then we would negotiate what would happen after that. Sure, sure. Oh, that's so funny. Um, so when you first came to New York, uh, you were working in advertising. Wait a second, we should stop. Is that me? Uh, I think it's in here. So when you first came to New York and you're working in the, in the advertising business, were you out as a, as a, as a gay man? About as much as you could be at that point. Yeah. And what, yeah. when was this, in the, in the early 70s? No, this was in the 60s, still oh, the wow. 60s. By okay. about 1970, I'd say I'd had enough of that. Really? Yeah, maybe, yeah, certainly by 71. Right. Occasionally I had freelances. But, I mean, advertising was still, it had this strange thing at that point where you had gay pockets. Like yeah. There were sort of agencies that were like, to almost, like half gay, but no one was totally out. It was like a, you know, the secret brotherhood, and you had the handshake and the, and the, you know, the, the secret handshake and the smile and the, um, you know, a lot of casting couch. Yeah, you did have casting couch that did go on. Yeah. Um, have you seen the show Mad Men? Of course, I love it. I but, I, but I only have one problem about yeah. that show. When I first saw that show, my problem was they weren't mean enough. <laughs> They're not cruel enough. The people I met when I worked in advertising were so much meaner than on that show. Yeah, 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 they were so much crueler than on that show that the show actually kind of glossed over yeah, how really yeah, mean it. that world was, especially back in that period. Because I worked uh, in advertising a little bit later. I, I came to New York in 1966. So yeah, a little and that's bit later than that. set in like 62. A little, little bit later than that, but not a whole lot later. It's, I, and one of the things that interests me about that show is the, the gay character who doesn't even really know he's gay. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, uh, it was very homophobic in certain levels. Right. Uh, and it all depended on which pocket you landed in. Like, there were very straight, very homophobic, cutthroat agencies where the idea of having, you know, like, uh, queers in it was anathema, even though they were there. Yes. That they always were totally in the closet. And then you'd have, uh, usually what was a giveaway was if the agency had fashion, um, mm -hmm. Clients, uh, and there were a lot of lesbians, mm -hmm. especially in, in fashion agencies, because they like the models. And uh, there were a couple, like uh, Jane Trey, who, who was like started Trey Wolf. She was a sort of famous closet lesbian. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, in the uh, some of the other uh, uh, larger agencies, uh, you'd have an art director who, who might be. You know, that way. Now, all of that really changed, I think, by about, certainly by the mid 70s. By that time, things have loosened up a lot. Gay liberation was there. Uh, and also, the whole world of advertising changed. Yeah. And when did you start writing um, books? Started writing books in the, uh, by 1990. But I've been writing gay stuff forever and publishing oh, it. Oh, yeah, I've been all over the publishing oh, world. So I've been writing the gay stuff since about, since 1969. Yeah, I mean, like when I got I got involved in the gay movement. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to be very involved in this 40th anniversary of Stonewall, because uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was involved in the radical gay world then, right. which was totally different from the world of advertising, the world of hustling. Sure. The, the gay liberation people were, at that point were very much against hustling because they thought it was exploitative, and. Uh, I always felt that uh, the real exploitation was simply not being allowed to be yourself. And that's what real exploitation is. So I never had that attitude. Uh, um, and um, so when you first were writing uh, this sort of gay themed stuff, was, yeah. was it uh, political? Was it erotic? Political. Was it, it was very political. It was very erotic. I mean, my work is. Can I show you my book? <laughs> my, my book, uh, this is my new book, Carnal Sacraments which is political, erotic, uh, economic. I deal with economics, because I think you cannot separate money from politics and power. And uh, I like powerful men. 
and I like writing about power for men. I think that the big difference between me as a gay writer and a lot of other gay writers is that uh, too much queerdom has to do with subverting power. Mm. They're scared of power because they never got it. Whereas as a kid growing up in the South, I was attracted to powerful gay men. I'm sorry, like powerful, that's an interesting Freudian stuff. I was attracted to powerful men. And, um, but you did slip gay in there when you didn't even and also gay that men. Right. And, also, yeah, and I'm attracted yeah, to powerful yeah, gay men. Yeah, I like powerful yeah, gay yeah, men. Yeah, yes, yeah, I, yeah. I don't like uh, the kind of castrating mm -hmm. queens who feel like the only power they're going to get is by being a bitch. Yeah. And unfortunately, like they're, still someone else, unfortunately yeah. they're still around. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, but uh, I like the largeness of this. And I found that exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah, you know, I, I worked for many years in Hollywood, and um, you know, there's like a, a gay mafia there oh. now. That's that's so the gay powerful. Turn. The what? The gay intern. <laughs> yes, yes. 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 And, uh, and Russia, yes. and when the Soviets first took over, they had the common turn. Yes. These are the people who are going to kill everybody else. Yeah. They had the gay intern. Really yes. Did, yes. Oh yeah, they're very powerful. Very. Powerful. Yes, they are. And it was shocking to me that um, how gay Disney is. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Well, they were one of the first companies to give a domestic partnership to, to their employees. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, and not so long ago, there was this, about maybe 10 years now, there was this scandal that the executives at Disney were bringing in boys to have sex with them, the men there. Good for them. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and everyone seemed shocked I'm, to hear I'm this. Just, I'm, just, I'm just disappointed I might be too old to be one of them. That's right, all. Right. You know, right. I realize. Yeah, there was this, it was, it was this great cry went up in Hollywood. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe this. I'm yeah. like, have you ever been there? Have yeah. you ever spent I mean, any time at all there? Yeah. Of course but you can believe you, that. I mean, but you, you do have these. Uh, I mean, but now you have, like, you have queer billionaires. Yes. Which is fantastic to me. I mean, why shouldn't there be queer billionaires? I like that idea. I just want to, well, I'd like to say I'd like to marry one, but I'm already married. You know? uh, and I'm glad that I, the, the partner I have, is, he's a doctor. Oh, so, yes. I see. Yeah. You found yourself a doctor. I, <laughs> but every Jewish boy should do. Exactly. To find herself a doctor. Your mother must it. be proud. Well, she's in heaven, but she likes him. She liked him yeah. better than me, actually. Did she? She, you know, finally, you know, my son marries a doctor. Isn't yeah. that funny? Like, my. Parents like all of my partners better than they like me. It, it's, isn't it perversity? It is. It is it's perversity. Yeah, yeah. And were you were your parents alive when you came out with these with these gay books? Uh, were they? My mother was alive when I started writing my gay stuff. My did you use your own name? Oh yes. Yeah. My father died when I was eleven. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that was a great tragedy of that yeah. that period. But my mother was alive, and she was always shocked by it. Was she shocked? Yeah, she felt like. This is private. It's okay as long as we keep this to ourselves. Yes, yes. This is sensitive and private, you know. So, and I just, I, and I remember I had an amazing exchange with her once uh, because I first started writing for a, uh, a gay paper that was a gay liberation paper, and I actually sent her a copy of it. I mean, I was proud of this, and here I was doing this. It was political, and she wrote me back. Uh, so, you know, she said. You, know, you you should keep this part of your life private. And I wrote her back and said, you live in Savannah, Georgia, where people keep all their hatred and prejudices public, and I'm supposed to keep this private? No way. So of course, that didn't help me. No, I'm sure that's just like, me. there's the fire, here's the gasoline, yes, and I'll pour it but on that's there. that's the way I felt like it. I felt, you know, in the deep south, it's okay to be open with your hatreds. And it, it's that way with, with a lot of people. I mean, they can be open with their hatreds, but you can't be open with your, your passions, your love of other people. And that's what I want. So do you feel like you learned anything when you were in the sex business, when you put your toe in that water? Uh, I learned that um, there's a reality to this that um, is always good. I mean, like, I don't, I, I never understood why people make, well, A, why there, there are laws against this kind of thing, because this is a human reality and a desire, and, uh, and when I was a young kid, I remember some guy was telling me about keeping boys, and he said, well, I think about it like this. I could pick up some chicken on the street, take him out for, one, uh, for dinner, wine and dine him, take him home and fuck him, and the next day be out you know, in the market for another one. Or I could just keep some guy at home and you know, take care of him and keep him well and enjoy him and love him, and why shouldn't I do that? And I thought, you know, th he's explaining a real reality here. And, uh, I think that, uh, that, like I said, if I were a beautiful woman and I had a choice between being a secretary or being a prostitute, I, 
Uh, I think I'd rather be a, a really nicely kept prostitute. I mean, there are bad things. I mean, there, there's exploitation in this world like in any other world. Uh, but I, I learned that there's a reality to this. And I also learned that you had to be very, very careful that there are people who would exploit you and hurt you. Yeah. And, I, and, and that was something that was very important to know. And do you feel like you grew up knowing this about the world, that there was, that this was, that you can, that there were people who were going to exploit you if they could? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah I lo certainly learned it in that, in that instance. Yeah. Yes, I did. But I didn't find that exploitation any worse than most of the exploitation that goes on in New York every day of the week in any kind of job situation where people are, you know, they're just done away with. You know, it's like, okay, so you have a family to support. You, have, you, know, you know, what's your problem? You know, that, that, that to me is worse. Yeah. I sound like a total socialist, but I am. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily socialism. Yeah. It sounds more like humanism. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm also that. People say to me all the time, oh, God, my God, how could you have been a prostitute? Well, right before I was a prostitute, I fried chicken for a living. Yeah. And it was a million times worse. It oh. was a horrible job. Not to mention what it did to the poor chicken. And <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about the chickens. Uh, you know, I'd work for a week and my paycheck, I would be like, yeah. not enough, not even right. close to enough to live wow. on. Yeah. I could make more in an hour. Yeah, and you felt appreciated. And I felt appreciated. Yeah. I was just saying before, I felt, you know, sort of powerful and sure. large. And, 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 and like someone, yeah, appreciated me enough to give me $100 for an hour, and that's yeah. a hooker's hour, which everyone knows is only 40 minutes. So yeah, like, just, like exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just like a shrink. Exactly. Just like a shrink. Exactly. Oh, God. And so this is your new book? This is my new book. Put it up again. It's called Carnal Sacraments, a historical novel of the future. And it takes place in the year 2075, when your lifespan will be determined by your job and position, which is hugely different from now. Yeah, that's hugely, that's God. <laughs> really, really different. Where'd you yeah. come up with that one? <laughs> well, I just think it'll just be much, much worse in the year 2075. But this um, book has all the elements that I like in the book. It's got sex, politics. Very funny. The place is very funny. It's got a really hot. Guy. It's got a scrumptious cover. cover. Super it's got a hot guy. The, the cover model is more famous than I am. Is he really? Oh, oh yes. dear. Yes. Oh dear. And he has some pubes showing, which yeah. I think yeah. is good. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, but he's a gorgeous thing, and uh, it's helped sell. It's helped sell the book. When did this come out? This came out in uh, 2007. But I'm still I'm still selling it. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Is that it? And what is are you working on something? Yes, I'm, my next book is going to be called The Manly Art of Seduction. Oh right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, it, is this like a is it a how to totally. book? It it's, is. A, it's a how to book and a workbook. It even has at the end of oh, the chapter, really, it even has great. things for you to do and think that's about great. and exercise. Become a better seducer. How to do that? But it's about seduction as part of all of human life. It's not seduction as like something the devil does. Yeah, right. But it's seduction as something that actually makes life work and brings people together, which is now a very difficult thing. It is. I think that people have a very hard time meeting each other now. Terrible time. I just moved to New York um, about a year ago. Yeah. And I had such a terrible time. Oh, they're so defended. Meeting people. Everyone's so defended. Developing a community. You know, I, I meet someone and then we exchange uh, information and then it's like they're, they're, they're gone. They think you're, they're, they're scared that you want to I'm exchange after some body fluids, fluids or something. Yeah, they, I don't they, they, understand yeah, it. Exchange it like you, you want to exchange blood and cup it, it, or something. It, exactly. Yeah, they, they really get very upset about that. I, I, and I keep thinking, well, is it, is it me? Have no, it's just the world we're in. And I feel like in New York City, it's more pronounced. Uh, it's very, but it's not 100% better anyplace yeah. else. I mean, in fact, I, I find LA to me well, much, just much, say more, LA level, is, much yeah. more lonely. People are trapped in their cars all day. And San Francisco, which used to be much more open, is now like you know yuppiness personified. Uh, and Boston is worse. God, I, mean, Boston, I describe Boston to make New York look like a housing project. Yeah, I mean, it's like you have to you know chuck your wallet at the door. Yeah, <laughs> so this is, I mean, New York can be friendly. It really can. Maybe it's the fact that because uh, I'm actually a southerner who lives here, uh, I talk to everybody. I really do. I do too, and people are, are slightly shocked when yeah. you speak to them. No, yeah, I talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. I just think about this point, they think I'm a loony old man. Right, right. And uh, that's good. You know, there's this whole idea, this, you know, this, uh, uh, youth and the young are start to be worshipped and revered, and there is something to that. I loved as long as I was young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was talking to a 19-year-old uh, recently, yeah. and he's like, dude, you're so old, man. Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah. He says, doesn't it suck? 
like, well, I mean, there are certain things well, that are doesn't know anything else except that. But I, I said, look, well, it, my situation is I live in a beautiful house and I have a, I, I, I write for a living. And I'm like, well, wh where do you live? Oh, dude, I'm crashing at somebody's house, but it's horrible. There's yeah. roaches and there's right. uh, fleas. Yeah. And well, uh, do you have a job? No, man, I got no money. Can you lend me ten bucks? But his whole life is a hard one. On and on. Yeah, but that's, <laughs> that's on the other side of the coin. I mean, exactly. His whole life is a hard one. I mean, when you're 19 years old, your whole life is a hard one. It is essentially. You know? I mean, yeah. that was the joy of being 19 years old. I, I think that whoever said life begins at 40 mm. was totally right. Really? They really understood everything. I mean, I've been happier in my 40s and 50s. And now than I've ever been in my whole life. I was not that happy as a young person. But you know, you wake up with a heart and go to sleep with one. Yeah. Yeah. So everything is this pursuit of yeah. sexual yeah. energy. Yeah. Not necessarily sexual uh, satisfaction, just the energy of it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when, when you're in it, it's like it's like uh, an addiction. It's intoxicating. Yeah, it's, it's like being on a drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's hard to get anything done. It is. Except other people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, other people yeah, I think on that we will close. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hard to get anything.